come to Christmas, we're reminded that the coming of Jesus is the coming of God and the coming of a king, <clears throat> the coming of the most important person who ever lived. And yet the people, the first people we meet in the story are modest, uh, ordinary senior citizens who had been carrying a burden for many, many years. And I think what you'll sense as we move through these stories of the first Christmas is that the people in the coming of Jesus that were surrounding those circumstances were as surprised to be included in the story as we would be if we were living in that day to be included in that story. And yet they were. I want to really walk through this section of Scripture with you and then draw some lessons from it. It says in verse 5 that this was the days of Herod. Now, Herod was uh, uh, an emperor over the Jewish region appointed by the Roman government. He was not a Jew himself. Uh, he was not a good king. Uh, it was dark times for Jewish people. Jewish people, from a national perspective, were discouraged. They, had, they knew they had a rich history, but they had felt probably God had forgotten about them. Uh, it had been 400 years since a prophet had spoken from God. The last one to have spoken was Malachi as the Old Testament ended. They had known that their story was a story of miraculous triumphs and prophets speaking for God and a, a people that had been selected by God who, for whom God had plans, who, for whom God had miraculously delivered them time and again throughout the, the history. But imagine for 400 years they had really just diminished in their national significance and in hearing from God. They, they felt like maybe God had given up on them or written them off. Most Jewish people were not passionate about their spiritual lives at that time. Most Jewish people were, uh, had forgotten about God, just as he had, as far as they were concerned, forgotten about them. They were living under Roman bondage, and they didn't like that. And in that setting, we're introduced to a couple who are the exception. Are you okay with being an exception to the world you live in? Uh, this couple, it says we're, we're living righteously before God. Um, there were basically two kinds of people in Israel. There were the large masses of irreligious uh, people who went about their lives as if God didn't exist. Then there, were the, there was the religious ruling class, uh, the, the, the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, and they, they weren't any more spiritual in the true sense. They were just religious. If, I think you hopefully understand what I mean by that. They were, they were, uh, their lives had been surrounded by the, the cultural religious trappings of temple life in Jerusalem. And they were Pharisees and they were rule keepers and they were proud and they found their identity and their pride and their ego and their self-righteous satisfaction in the rules they kept and in the ceremonies they followed. And, and that was basically what you had in Israel by and large. But, but there were pockets of people, people like Mary and Joseph and people like Zacharias and Elizabeth who were humble, faithful, sincere believers who believed that even though God hadn't spoken for hundreds of years, that He was worthy of their faith and obedience and worthy of their worship. God knows who these people are and where these people are. And he comes to this couple. We are told in verse 7 that, that Elizabeth was barren. Uh, that's a, it's an old word for saying that she was infertile. And the context implies that she was beyond childbearing years, as was Zacharias. The inability to have a child is heartbreaking. The inability to have a child in those days was. stigmatizing because the Jewish people believed that, and this was incorrect, of course, but they believed superstitiously that if you couldn't have children, that must be an indication of God's displeasure toward you. And so people didn't really know what Elizabeth and Zacharias had done wrong, uh, 
but they assume they must have had done something wrong. And here's a couple who have been trying to walk obediently to the Lord, and their neighbors think God's mad at them for something that they've done, and it's heartbreaking. He was a priest. There were probably 20,000 priests at this time. There were a lot of them. They had duties in their villages wherever they lived. They would, they would teach the scriptures, read the scriptures, meet with the Jewish people on the Sabbath and, and teach. And, and they would counsel people and they would actually provide judgment for the Jewish people. They, they worked as the court system the priests did in Jewish culture. And they had these, these roles and responsibilities. They didn't all live around Jerusalem, around the temple. But two weeks a year, six months apart, priests, no matter where they lived in the, in the greater Israel area, they would be um, brought to Jerusalem for a week to work at the temple, kind of at the headquarters. And this was Zacharias's week to go from the village where he lived in the hills into the city not far from there, a few miles from there in Jerusalem. And it was his week to perform duties in Jerusalem. It was his, they were divided into 24 courses, the, uh, or groups, groupings, the priests were. And so... It was his group's turn. Now, his group would have consisted of hundreds and hundreds of priests. And different priests had different duties for that week related to all of the ceremonies surrounding the temple. And they would have a lottery system. They would cast lots as to what job each priest would get for those, that seven-day period. And the lot fell to Zacharias to burn incense on the altar of incense inside the holy place that was the number one most cherished or sacred job a priest could be given most priests would live and die and never have that opportunity and this was his opportunity in in verses uh um, in verse nine to have this privileged honor to go into a place where the rest of the nation couldn't go and where many priests would never go and to have this job. Now, the altar of incense sat uh, in front of the curtain behind which was the holiest place. And, and the Jews believed that you were never any closer to God than when you were doing this right here. And they, what they would do is they would keep this fire burning 24-7, 365 on this altar. So every morning and every evening, a, a priest's duty would be to go in and bring a mixture and put it on these coals and smoke ascended to the roof of the temple when, that, when, when he did that each morning and each evening. And it represented the people's worship, prayers, repentance, and humility toward their creator God, Yahweh, Jehovah. And he was doing this duty when in verse number 11 it says an angel appeared to him. Now here's something that didn't happen to any other priest ever. An angel appeared to him. The first thing the angel said, and you're going you're gonna to see this if you read the Bible very frequently, the first thing angels usually say is, don't fear, because it was an intimidating thing. Angels were intimidating supernatural uh, creatures uh, sent from heaven. Do not fear. He said, uh, God has heard your prayer, and you're going to have a son. He's going to be great, verse 15, and he's going to turn many of his countrymen back to God. People like Zacharias wished that their neighbors and friends and countrymen would turn back to God. And he found that he was going to have a son that was going to turn many back to God. And then the angel used a phraseology that could have only meant one thing. The angel said, your son is going to make ready a people for the Lord, which Zacharias, as a student of the Scriptures, knew was a reference to the prophecy in Malachi as to the forerunner of the Messiah. Jewish people for hundreds of years had believed and had been told by the prophets in the Scripture that a Messiah would come, a deliverer, the greatest ruler and conqueror in the history of the nation, greater than David, greater than Moses, greater than Saul or Solomon. The greatest one would come. Messiah. And, and they all longed for, especially the devoted ones, longed for and waited for the coming of the Messiah. And with those prophecies, they were told, before the Lord comes as Messiah, one will come to make ready the people for Him in the spirit of Elijah, the forerunner, 
of the Messiah. And he knew immediately what he was being told, that he was going to be given a son, which was a miracle in and of itself for senior citizens who'd been infertile all their lives and now were past the traditional age of childbearing biologically. And yet it was a double miracle because not only would his wife have a son, but he would be this long-awaited prophesied preparer for the Messiah. Well, he wasn't so, so sure he believed. And so the angel said, you want a sign to show that this is all real? You're going to lose your voice and your hearing until this comes true. And so he, the people were waiting outside. Whenever a priest took longer than he was supposed to take inside the temple, they got worried outside because they had been told that you go in there with some sin in your life and you're going to drop dead. Uh, so the people are like, uh, do we need to send somebody in there to check on him? And, um, and yet he did come out. And they immediately knew that something had happened supernatural because he, he couldn't speak. All he could do was make motions to them. Well, he went home and sure enough, Elizabeth got pregnant. Verses 24 and 25. The Bible says that she hid herself. She didn't leave the house for five months. Now, why, why would you do that? I think it's because she knew no one would believe her. She knew if she was six weeks pregnant, you don't show yet then, that if she left the house and started telling people, they would probably lock her up and say she's crazy. And so she, she kept to into the house. I think, and then when she came out of the house after five months, <laughs> it was going to be obvious. If she says I'm expecting, she's really expecting. I think there's a rule that you, when you think someone might be expecting because there's something there, I think there's a rule, you don't ask, right? <laughs> Some of you had to learn that rule the hard way. You don't ask. When's your baby due? Um, 22 years ago, last month, Nicole and I were delivering turkeys and groceries to families in Lancaster, California who needed groceries for Thanksgiving. Our church delivered hundreds of turkeys and bags of groceries to families in the community that, that um, we knew needed the groceries. And so we went with another couple we were both in our early 20s, us and our friends, and the four of us went to deliver these, these groceries. We went to two or three homes, and the people were very appreciative, and I'll never forget. And Nicole was five or six months pregnant with our daughter, Taylor, our firstborn. And we're standing there with a bag of groceries, and our friends are standing there, and they've got a turkey in their hands. And, and the four of us are standing at the door, and the people obviously see that Nicole's expecting, and, and, and that begins um, to open up a conversation about the fact that it's our first child that we're expecting. And, and then they looked at our friend, and they said, when are you due? She wasn't expecting. And they learned that day, you don't ask. <laughs> when is your baby due? So Elizabeth waited until it was going to be obvious and she left the house. This is Luke chapter 1. This is what we're reading about here. In verses 26 through 38, uh, we skip, we're skipping that section because in that section, the narrative shifts away from Zacharias and Elizabeth and shifts to Mary. And the same angel that appeared to Gabriel next to the altar of incense appears to Mary and says, you're going to have a child. And then we get down to verse 36. 30, yeah, 36. And the angel Gabriel tells Mary that she needs to go visit her cousin Elizabeth because one of the proofs as to the fact that God is doing a miracle is that her cousin is now expecting. Mary didn't know that. They live 50 miles away in Nazareth. And the angel says to her, I know this is amazing what you're hearing, that you're a virgin, but you're going to have a baby. And if you want some proof as to the fact that God's doing miracles right now and you're in the middle of it, your cousin, the senior citizen, she's expect the infertile one, she's expecting. Seriously? So Mary knew that if she went to visit Elizabeth, Elizabeth would probably be the one person in the world who would believe her about the story of an angel came to me and he said, I'm going to have a baby, and he's going to be the Son of God, the Messiah. And so she visited. Look at verse 39. 
Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spake out of a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. (laughs) Supernaturally, Elizabeth realized something in the moment that Mary spoke to her, and in the moment when the, the rumbling in her stomach was very different than the kicking that she had been feeling for a few months, and this baby did a somersault in her womb because she knew that her baby was the one who was going to be the announcer of the Messiah, and now here Mary walks in and she realizes her baby in her womb six months gestation, realizes that the baby in the womb of the woman who's just walked in is the one he's going to introduce to the world. In case you're wondering, um, the shepherds weren't the first ones to rejoice at Jesus' coming. John the Baptist was, even though he was in the womb. And in case you're wondering, children in their mother's womb matter. It's interesting, the Bible doesn't ever use the word pregnant. The Bible says, when it speaks of a woman carrying a a baby, it says she's with child. It doesn't say she's with embryo. It doesn't say she's with fetus, which it would be okay if it did, because the word fetus means child. Um, It says she's with child. After this unusual supernatural interaction between Mary and her cousin Elizabeth, uh, Mary sings. And verses 46 through 56 record her song. And then verse 57 tells us that when Elizabeth's full time came, uh, she brought forth her son. And then verse 58 tells us that her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy on her, and they rejoiced with her. In verse 58, we learn that the city, or the, the village, I should say, gathered together to... Uh, circumcise the boy. I mean, only the father was going to circumcise him, but the city gathered together. It was, a, it was a custom, a strange one, yes, but it was a custom in Jewish culture that when a child was eight days old, the city would gather together, the, 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 the townspeople, if you will, and they would circumcise the child, and on that day they would name him. And so the, the people of the village of Zacharias and Elizabeth, their friends and neighbors, gathered together. They were so happy for them. They were so amazed by this. This was an undeniable miracle. And they said, isn't this exciting? There's a little Zacharias Jr. And Mary, or Elizabeth said, no, no, no. We're not going to name him Zacharias, which would have been a common thing to do. We're going to name him John. Well, wait a minute, Elizabeth. Why name him John? Uh, well, that's what the angel told us to name him. And they argued with her. And... Then Zacharias, who for nine months and eight days, at least, has been mute, asks for a tablet. And, and, and so they give him a tablet, and he writes on the tablet in, in sort of uh, emphatic fashion as only a strong father could. His name is John. I'm sure his eyebrows went down like this. His name is John. And everyone said, okay, fine. His name is John. And... Uh, As soon as he wrote on that tablet, his mouth opened up and his ears opened up. It says in verse uh, 64, his mouth was opened immediately and his tongue was loosed and he spake and he praised God. Three months later, um, Jesus would be born. And 30 years later, this child would introduce Jesus to the world as John the Baptist. There are four lessons that I would say we could take away from this. If you think about Zacharias and Elizabeth's story and lay it alongside of your story. First of all, there's a lesson about our waiting while God is working. For years they had not had a child, verse 7 says, and they were old, well stricken in years. Israel felt forgotten nationally. Zacharias and Elizabeth could have certainly felt forgotten personally. And what I want us to learn from Zacharias and Elizabeth is 
that God's silence is not God's absence. There might be a need that you have, a desire that you have, a longing in your heart, or a burden that you're carrying. And I would just encourage you, if I could encourage you with what Zacharias and Elizabeth learned, God hasn't forgotten you. And He's not far away. Waiting time is not wasted time. Are you waiting for anything? Waiting time is not wasted time because while you're waiting, God is working. Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should not have compassion on the child of her, the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet God says, I will not forget you. <laughs> it's not likely that a mother would forget her nursing child. And we have dozens of mothers in this church that could testify to that. But, even if they did, you can be sure that God won't forget and has not forgotten you. It's interesting, Zacharias' Hebrew name, God has remembered again. That's what it means in Hebrew. He, he said, the angel said to Zacharias, your prayer is heard. God hears your prayers. I think sometimes we neglect to pray because we don't always see the answer to our prayer as quickly as we would or as clearly as we would like to. But Scripture teaches that uh, 1 Peter 3.12, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and His, <clears throat> excuse me, His ears are open to their prayers. The Lord's ears are open to your prayers. The Lord's hand isn't shortened that it can't save and His ears aren't closed that they can't hear, Isaiah says. Elizabeth said it's something really beautiful in, in verse 25. She said, once, once she learned the news and found out she was expecting as an old woman, she said, the Lord looked on me. The Lord looked on me. You know God looks on you. God sees you. He sees what you're struggling with. He sees what you're waiting for. He sees what you're trying to manage. And I would just encourage you, don't live your days like so many of their neighbors did as if God had forgotten them and as if they had forgotten Him. Instead, be like Elizabeth. Lean into your relationship with the Lord. Keep praying, keep waiting, keep hoping, and you'll say, you know what? God did see me. What do we need as God's working and we're waiting? We need patience. Patience. Hebrews 10, 36. You have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might see the promise. God's leadership in His children's lives is this. You do what He's asked you to do. Day after day, week after week, month after month. Sometimes things will go well. Sometimes things will go poorly. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. And, and God will reward patient faith. I believe you'll see it rewarded in this life frequently but He will absolutely, no doubt, reward it in the next life. And when eternity begins, and when 10,000 years have expired, the burdens we carried, the things we had to wait for, will be a distant, less than a distant memory. So keep trusting. Keep enduring. Let us not become weary in well-doing, because in due season, we will reap if we faint not. There's a lesson about our waiting while God is working. Secondly, there's a lesson about how God's plans for us fit within His redemptive plan. God has a redemptive plan for the whole world. Every person on the planet is an object of God's or a target in God's redemptive plan. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So there's this redemptive plan for the world, and there's a lesson here about how God's plans for us fit within His redemptive plan for the world. Not only God can do this. We live in a world where we think there's always a give and a take, and if one person wins, another person has to lose, and if, another, if one person makes progress, another person uh, has to have uh, been sacrificed in order for someone else to make progress. But actually, in God's economy, while God is orchestrating His plan for redemption that involves 
millions of moving parts, His good plan for your life fits perfectly, ingenious, and beautifully within that redemptive plan. And that's what they learned. That their little lives, he's a priest, sounds important. Eh, there's 20,000 of them. Uh, they live in a village. We don't even know the name of the village. Um, they're, they're not well off. They're modest. Nobody knows them. They don't make any headlines. They're old. They've been waiting for a child. People think that there's something wrong with them. And yet they discover in due time that their little lives, their quiet little lives, are part of God's big plan. And I would just tell you that as true as that is of Zacharias and Elizabeth, it's true of you. Your little life, my little life, is a part of God's big plan. They had known that there had been a Messiah prophesied. And they had also known that there had been a forerunner prophesied. And they knew Malachi 3.1, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And when the phraseology was used in verses 15, 16, and 17, he shall turn many of the children back to the Lord their God and he shall go before him to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That this was a clear reference to not only Malachi 3, but also Malachi 4 and passages in Isaiah that had talked about this forerunner. What they didn't know was Messiah wasn't going to just be a political or military conqueror, which most Jewish people assumed. He was going to be a spiritual deliverer. That Jesus wasn't going to come primarily to deliver the Jews from Roman oppression. He was going to come to deliver all nations, any people from all nations who would turn to Him in repentant faith from not temporary, earthly, physical tyranny, but from eternal spiritual tyranny and destruction. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. This was the unfolding and the breaking open on earth of heaven's redemptive plan. And Zacharias and Elizabeth, with their little lives, with circumstances beyond their control, were a part of it. In your life, because you're a member of the body of Christ, because Christ is in you, His Spirit is in you, and you are in Him, if you're a believer, you are part of God's redemptive plan. You'll see it if you look for it. If you walk through life looking for realizations that you're on mission from the Lord and that He's planted His Spirit in you and He's made you His ambassador, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in this world, you'll see how that God's redemptive plan for this world includes your little life and the circumstances in your life story. The work that Jesus began in His physical body 2,000 years ago, He now continues through His spiritual body. We are a part of His plan. And as sure as their lives were woven into God's story, your life, if you're a believer, Scriptures teach, is woven also into God's story. There's a lesson about how God's individual plans for us fit within His redemptive plan for the world. The third lesson is that there's a lesson here about believing God when He speaks. Zacharias had gotten so used to his prayer not being answered that when God finally said, I'm answering your prayer, he said, no, nah, I don't think that could happen. He was looking at himself, looking at his wife. He felt like what the angel, he thought to himself, this angel was probably expecting some young buck to come in here and, and offer incense on this altar. I think this smoke is clouding his vision. He can't see that I'm an old man. And he says, I'm an old guy. And it's funny if you look at the, Hebrew, or the Greek language that's used to construct all this. Uh, Gabriel is the angel. There's only two angels. There's tens of thousands of angels, we're told in Scripture. Only two of them we know their names, Michael and Gabriel. And Zacharias would have known that Gabriel was the angel that appeared to Daniel. He understood that. So this is Gabriel. This is an important messenger from God. And so Gabriel's name means... God's valiant one or God's hero, hero of God. 
And so if you look at the Greek language, he, Zach, Zacharias says, I am old. And, and the angel says back to him, I am Gabriel. <laughs> like, like, it doesn't matter if you're old, if God's hero has come from God's throne to tell you a message. And he basically asks for a sign, which is a really common thing to do in the Old Testament. Ask for a sign as to this miracle. Gideon asked for a sign. Uh, uh, Moses asked for a sign. So he asked for a sign. Um, Gabriel was not happy with that. Um, and, and I'm thinking to myself, is an angel next to the altar of incense not a sign? But he asks for a sign, and Gabriel says, okay, you want a sign? Unbelieving Zacharias? Because you didn't believe? Here's the sign. You just lost your voice and hearing. Until this is done. Which ultimately would be just over nine months. Because you didn't believe. Um, here's something to remember from Zacharias. God is never limited by the things that limit us. Sure, we have limits. God has none. So here's a little piece of advice. If you want to experience God's favor in your life, stop telling Him what He can't do. Our belief doesn't hinder God's plan. It just hinders our privilege of being involved in it as much. For example, his wife did get pregnant a few days later, maybe a few weeks later. And he couldn't tell anybody. <laughs> He couldn't rejoice and explain. I mean, he was used to speaking like pastors speak. He was a priest in his village. He was used to speaking to his neighbors about the truths of God every week, every day maybe. And he couldn't for nine months. He was put on the bench because of his unbelief. Temporarily, people who don't believe God miss out on opportunities to serve and glorify Him. And Zacharias missed out. But he got back in the game when God opened his mouth. I like what Corey Ten Boom said. She said, I have found that there are three stages in every great work of God. First, it is impossible. Then it is difficult. And then it is done. God delights in doing the impossible. In fact, that's what he had said, Gabriel had said, to Mary. Mary didn't have the same unbelief as Zacharias. She had a very fair question. Um, you know, I'm a virgin, right? Uh, I don't think that's possible for me to have a baby. Um, she wasn't doubting. She was confused. And so the angel said to her, I'm going to give you a sign. You go see your cousin. She's old and she's expecting. And then the angel said this in verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. What God promises, God delivers. Scripture says it is impossible for God to lie. And finally on that day, when he demonstrated his faith, he had learned his lesson. Nine months later, he obeyed the Lord and he said, His name is John. Uh, his mouth was opened and his ears were opened. And he learned a valuable lesson about believing God when he speaks. The final lesson comes in the final 15 or 16 verses of the chapter. When Zacharias, after having had his mouth opened, engages in a Holy Spirit-directed song, lyrics, that he, he shouts to his neighbors in the village, holding his newborn baby in his arms about who Jesus is. And it is a lesson about the true significance of Jesus' arrival. Zacharias' song is about his son in one way, but it's really more about what God is doing that his son is going to get to be a part of introducing. And he sings this song that's rooted in rich Jewish history, that's filled with symbolism that we're going to just have to show you the high points of quickly. His song begins in verse 68. And he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has visited 
and redeemed his people. The first thing that Zacharias' song tells us about Jesus is that Jesus redeems us from captivity. Redemption means to purchase someone's freedom. Redemption means to pay a price that frees someone from slavery. And that's what Jesus came to do. We are slaves to our sin and to sin's consequences for all of eternity. But Jesus came and on the cross, He paid the price to deliver us from that. The second part of His song begins in verse 69. Look at verse 69. God raised up a horn of salvation. That's a, ter- that's a symbolism that describes a horned animal pushing with power against enemies. He spoke by the mouth of His prophets. Verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies. Jesus not only redeems us from captivity, He rescues us from our enemies. Verses 74 and 75 are two of my very favorite Christmas verses. Look at them. That He would grant us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve Him without fear in holiness and righteousness before Him all the days of our life. God's vision in sending Jesus is that we don't live defined by fear or bondage, but instead we live a life that is defined by serving Him without fear in holiness and righteousness. Our lives aren't defined anymore by fear of judgment or fear of the unknown. They're defined by courage and serving the Lord and walking in holiness before the Lord. Not the not the pharisaical, legalistic rule-keeping of the ritualistic Pharisees, but true holiness, true righteousness, walking in harmony with God. That's what the Christian life is. Jesus' deliverance of you isn't just a get-out-of-jail-free card. Jesus' deliverance of you is that you would serve Him in holiness and righteousness all the days of your life. Jesus redeems us from captivity, rescues us from the enemy, cancels Verse 76, the guilt of our sin. Verse 76, 77, to give knowledge of salvation to His people by the remission of their sin. To remit sin is to send sin away. And that's why 30 years later, this little baby boy that Zacharias is holding, John the Baptist, is going to grow up And 30 years later, he's going to stand around the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is going to walk down the road and he's going to say, Behold! The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus cancels the guilt of our sin. And then finally, verses 78 and 79, Jesus shines the light in our dark world. The day spring from on high has visited us. That's a sunrise. To give light to those who sit in darkness, verse 79, and in the shadow of death. Those groping for answers in the darkness, lost and confused, not being able to make heads or tails of how they got here and why they were created and what their purpose is and where they're going one day. People who sat in darkness have now seen a great light and that light is Jesus. So, we today have the advantage of looking at Zacharias and Elizabeth's story with hindsight. And we see how God wove their circumstances together to create a beautiful plan. You and I are living in the middle of our stories. And what I want to say this morning is that what's true of Zach and Elizabeth is as true of you. If you're waiting, God's working. His individual plans for you fit perfectly within His grand redemptive plan for this world. When He speaks, you can believe Him and you'll be glad you did. And He came as your deliverer, your rescuer, your forgiver, and the light that makes sense of time and eternity. If you have not yet received Jesus as your Savior by faith, like the ones gave testimony this morning in their baptisms, I hope you will this morning. If you have received Jesus, I hope you'll leave with, filled with courage and faith that God's at work in and through your life as He was in theirs. Could we bow together for prayer? I just want to pray and give you an opportunity in your seat to seek the Lord and to think about what you've heard.
and to thank the Lord for His work in your life. If you have never received Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, you've never made that decision or taken that leap of faith that says, God, save my soul. I believe in you. I believe what you did for me. And even though I've probably known about you or heard about you my whole life, now I want to begin my relationship with you. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. With our heart we believe and with our mouth we ask. That's Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you're here this morning and you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died and rose from the grave and that only that work can save you and bring you into a relationship with Him, I would encourage you to just whisper a prayer from your seat and say, Lord, would you save me? Would you save me? I believe that Jesus Christ came for me And I want to ask you to be my Savior. Rescue me from the consequences of my sin and make me your child. If you're praying that prayer this morning or if you have questions about taking that step or making that decision, I hope you'll speak to me or some trusted friend afterwards and let's let's get those questions answered. Or or if you're making that decision this morning, let's, uh, let's get some resources into your hands so you can grow in that new relationship. You can write us a note on the connection card and turn that in when you leave or uh, speak to one of us afterwards. If you're watching online, you can send us a message, of course. We want to connect with you and encourage you in your relationship with God.